Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy, where we explore the scriptural, theological, and historical case for plural marriage. What a week this has been. Many, if not most of you, will be aware by now of the huge announcement that the LDS Church has purchased. It sounds like almost all of the properties, I don't want to overstate, but um, an immense amount of properties and historical documents from the community of Christ. That includes the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, the Kirtland Temple, the Nauvoo House, the Red Brick Store, Joseph and Emma's House, the um, the grave sites, the list goes on and on and on. And anyway, a lot more information has gone on from there. As you will hear us discuss in this conversation, incredibly, I had already scheduled this conversation with Cheryl and Dan Clute to take place the very next day after that big announcement came out. So I see the hand of the Lord all over this. You'll remember the Clutes, that they are members of the um, restoration branches, and they are right in the middle of all of this happening. So we got to talk about this huge announcement with people right there in the middle of it, which I think is incredible. And also we had planned to talk about blood atonement, the stories of people escaping from Utah. And so I hope that you will enjoy this conversation with Cheryl and Dan Clute talking about these momentous things happening this week, as well as some very momentous things that happened in the past. So thank you for so much for joining us as we take this deep dive into the very murky waters of Mormon polygamy. Welcome to this episode of 132 Problems. I am here again with my dear friends, Cheryl and Dan Clute, who have so kindly and graciously agreed to come back on and help me with a topic that I have been immensely interested in. Those who listen to my podcast know that I started to try to cover blood atonement quite a while ago and got really deep into that research when I just had to set it aside and go on other things and I haven't gotten back to it. But Cheryl, in the meantime, for about, I don't know, has it been a year or more? In has May. Been, okay, has been sending me resources and um, stories of people who had to flee Utah and live to tell their tales. tales. And maybe she has more information than that of some who someone else had to tell their story for them. Anyway, I've asked Cheryl and Dan to compile some of the stories that we as members of the LDS church that have our heritage or even Utah Mormons or just Utahns in general, maybe aren't aware of. This is some of the history of our, some of our history that we don't know about. And I asked Dan and Cheryl to come and talk to us about it. And I want to say from the outset, like, I know some people might hear this with some degree of skepticism. And I, I just want to to say these sources exist. These are stories that were reported and told and they're no more or less valid than any other history that exists. They are, they exist. We should know about them. We should pay attention to them and people are free to go investigate them further. I know that Cheryl and Dan have a lot of additional resources and reading that they're going to include for anyone who wants to study more because this is a big topic and they could only give us a small sampling. Cheryl and Dan, did I do an okay job on that? Yep. Very good. Very good. And I guess we should introduce you guys again if for anyone who hasn't. I hope everyone has watched the first episode I did with Cheryl and Dan because it's fabulous. But do you guys want to introduce yourselves or do you want me to? You can if you want, Michelle. Okay. I, can do it. I don't want to take up too much time. So, Well, let me just quickly refresh people's memory. Cheryl was a member of the original RLDS church and was there in the 1980s when the church went quite liberal and the breakoffs left the church and formed the restoration branches. This is amazing that we're talking today because she was there when all of the biggest wards that paid the most tithing to what was the RLDS church left because of the direction the RLDS church went. And that has huge implications into what just happened when we're recording this, it just happened yesterday. I just reported with John Hayacek. So we're going to talk about that as well. So Cheryl and Dan have been cl friends, close friends with the prices. They live right next door to the Restoration Bookstore. The prices are the ones who, um, who wrote 
Joseph Smith fought polygamy. So they have been front and center for all of this. And Cheryl has been studying all of these topics for decades, trying to help people like me, the LDS people, know more about our history. How did I do there? You go ahead and fill in anything I missed. That's that's pretty good. You got okay. a good memory. <laughs> right. Yeah, Dan and I weren't surprised at all yesterday when we got the news uh, because we were actually on a tour in uh, July of 2017 uh, back east, and we were the only RLDS restorationists on the bus. They were all LDS. And when we pulled into the Kirtland Temple, several of them started telling us that there's news that at some point the uh, LDS church was going to purchase the Kirtland Temple. And I, I told them then, I said, I wouldn't doubt it because they're going to sell everything to pad their retirement funds. And so uh, we weren't caught off guard at all. And then when we were, we were actually with the same group of LDS people um, doing a dig up in Nauvoo and uh, 20, what was it, 2017 or 18? 17, I think, or 18, I can't remember. But anyway, when uh, the news came out that they had sold the Book of Mormon manuscript and the president of the Community Christ Church said at least seven times that it was to support their retirement funds. And one of our LDS friends actually looked at us and said, that's all they care about is making sure they're going to have enough money to support themselves. And I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, when it came yesterday about it, we were really, uh, you know, weren't taken back. We weren't surprised, but it was hurt, hurtful uh, because, you know, like, you know, Michelle, my family were in Nauvoo and they, they left. They did not leave at first. Uh, but later on, they did leave, but they ended up coming into the organization under their original baptisms and ordinations in the late uh, 1860s, when Joseph Smith III had already taken over the church in 1860. And growing up, I mean, my aunt, my great aunt Maudie, she knew firsthand, because she was born in 1888, she knew a lot of these Ganans that had been there, and she got firsthand accounts from them, and she would tell me and my mother, about them. Um, and it's really heartbreaking because, you know, I feel like they sold our birthright. You know, Emma, Emma Smith, she, she, that inspired version manuscript, she made a special place in her petticoat and she sewed, sewed it in there so she could wear it every day so that the, um, Brigham and them would not be able to get it and find it because she wanted all the papers and, and all the manuscripts and journals or whatever that Joseph had in the red brick store or wherever his office was. She wanted all them, but um, they wouldn't they wouldn't give them to her. So mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff right. rust and knowing growing up, I was told over and over that it was all doc, the documents that went west was changed the history of the church and that they raised stuff and wrote stuff in and um i may not get into all that today but michelle in my research where i've been working i have got stuff that proves that oh okay i would let's have another conversation in the future about that topic about forgeries and altering documents there's so many people that saw this firsthand being documented okay. I was thinking this morning, Michelle, about the Inspired Version manuscripts. And uh, in the Doctrine and Covenants, she shut my phone off or I would have read it, read it to you. It's in yours also. But referring to those manuscripts, it stated that they would be preserved in safety. And who did the Lord use to preserve them in safety? Well, Emma, like she just said, mm -hmm. she'd hide it. I guess probably when she left her house, she'd hide it in her petticoat or whatever. And I think her house, a time or two, there was, they got up in the morning and someone tried to set a fire or whatever. And I believe, if I remember correctly, she said she always believed she'd be safe as long as those manuscripts were in there because the Lord would be taking care of them and preserving them. So when Joseph III uh, united with the organization, I think it was a short time after that, 
uh, the, the, they sent a couple of representatives from the RLDS to Emma to take those uh, manuscripts uh, from her of the inspired version of Joseph Smith translation. And it said that she gladly handed them over to them. So the reorganization always felt like that, that they, the Lord was using them to preserve those manuscripts of the Joseph Smith translation in safety. So I was thinking this morning, um, I think there's something to that. Now, the LDS church is going to be the one that preserves them in safety. And so I think the Lord, he looks way beyond where we do in things. And so the other example of that was uh, David Whitmer, when he lived up in Richmond, Missouri, Oliver Cadre, and, and he both lived up there when they died. But he had the manuscript to the Book of Mormon up there. I think it was the one that was actually purchased from the, the RLDS for five or six years ago, whatever. But he had that manuscript up in Richmond and a huge tornado come through and tore a lot of stuff up through there, didn't touch his house because those manuscripts were in there. And he believed yeah. that's why his home was preserved because the Book of Mormon, those Book of Mormon manuscripts were there. And, and the Lord was preserving them in safety. So I think, I think that alone, we talked the last time we talked that all the, just a list of everything that, that was sold, not just the, the, the temple uh, or some, but just well, a lot of things were sold. So I think, we should, I think the Lord's preserving them in safety. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. We should back up and fill people in because we didn't, anyone who hasn't been watching what's been happening. So today that we're recording this is Wednesday the 6th, March 6th. On March 5th, it was announced, It was the news was broken by John Hayacek, who put his own offer in. The Community of Christ, so the RLDS Church changed to become the Community of Christ. And they, at the t uh, around the time that they forced many of you out, that many of you felt like you couldn't stay anymore, they have had in their possess possession the Kirtland Temple, Many of the Kirtland um, properties, Joseph and Emma's homestead, also the mansion house, the the grave sites. What help me know what else? Yeah, in Nauvoo, and they. Oh, Red those Brick things are in Nauvoo. I'm sorry. Yes, the um, Red Brick the store. Nauvoo house, the Red Brick store. Those things in Nauvoo. Okay, and then also the Kirtland Temple in Kirtland. And are there other properties in Kirtland as well? I'm not really too sure. We'll need to look that up. Those were kind of the big things, probably, but there was a lot of little things also. My son sent me a list he got somewhere of a lot of little things also that was sold. Yeah, uh, we'll post that below. But also another big thing is the original Joseph Smith translation that was also included. And so the RLDS Church announced, Is it was it President Vesey? Is that who it was who announced that they didn't have the... They didn't have the finances to fulfill the, fill their obligations for the retirement funds for the employees, yeah, yes, the leaders uh -huh. of the church. Yeah, and so and so that's how you knew because you told me in our last conversation that this was going to happen. You were prophets. It's true, and and this is what's been amazing. Is well, this is this is all crazy. I'll tell you from my perspective. I did a, a recording on um, Monday with the, a historian named Cheryl Bruno, who's fantastic, and we had been talking a bit about John Hayacek. So yesterday morning, I texted John and was like, "Hey, just wanted to let you know we were talking about you, and you know we had a great conversation. And when when can you talk again?" And then he responded, and then just like an hour later, he was live on Facebook announcing. That, that had happened. So I texted him back and was like, come talk to me about it. And we had this interview scheduled for today already. So it feels very providential that all of this is happening. And I wasn't necessarily planning to um, post our conversation this coming Sunday, I guess today when it's being released. But I talked to my editor. I'm like, okay, we're doing the clues on Sunday because this is all incredible that this happened right now and that we were going to talk. So I did want to say the story you're talking about with Emma and the petticoats and the, the manuscript that I think is part of why she was, she dared to walk across the frozen river. Was it the Missouri river? I'm not great with geography. Mississippi. The Mississippi, Mississippi, that was the Mississippi. And she had one baby in each arm, little Joseph and Julia hanging each to one side of her skirts. She was carrying her two babies and her two little children. And the only thing she carried with her other than her children was the manuscript in her skirts, 
which that is the dedication and sacrifice that is the heritage of the RLDS church. And when I'm looking at it, I see, I don't want to offend anyone who's RL, who's, who's community in the community of Christ. I think they're great people. However, to me, it feels like they betrayed their founders. They betrayed Emma and Joseph the third, first of all, by, by starting to declare that Joseph was a polygamist and that the Book of Mormon wasn't inspired and that Joseph was a charlatan, which is where they went. So that's what they did that forced you to, you to leave Cheryl. And then, and now we're just a little while longer where they've betrayed this other part of their heritage to give away all of the, well, sell, not give away, but sell all of the important artifacts that were entrusted to their care. So I guess it just follows because they had already sold the reputation of our founding family, Joseph and Emma and Joseph the third, because if you claim that Joseph was a polygamist, they were all liars. And Emma was a crazy lady, right? So they've already betrayed that. And now they've betrayed this part of it is how I would imagine you guys might be feeling about this. I'm, I'm uh, just sitting here, tears in my eyes, um, you know, because, you know, my ancestors, you know, they went through the Great Depression, and a lot of my ancestors did, and they sacrificed so much to help pay the funds when they had what was called the Independent Sanitarium and Hospital to be built for the Saints. And then Rest Haven was gonna, was like a, a retirement place where people that got sick elderly could go. And if you didn't have the money to go, they would take care of it. They sold our cemetery. They sold... The sanitarium, the hospital. They sold all of it. The hospital, the nursing home, the the cemetery. They've been the Hans Mill. They've sold everything they can. Thousands of acres of farmland. Uh, best best farmland there is along the Missouri River. The most richest soil there is. They've sold it all for their retirement funds. Harold, and, we had our own publishing house. Harold Publishing House. All this has been sold. I'm just Michelle. I'm just thankful that my parents and my and my great aunt Maudie, that was like my grandmother, she, you know, she taught us to is growing up, and my mother too, do not put your trust in the arm of flesh. If a prophet says or does anything that goes against former revelation, don't believe it. And that's how we knew in 1984 when all this star, stuff started coming out. And I'm thankful that we left in 84 and that not one cent of our tithing for the last 40 years has been contributed to their retirement funds. It's gone to help the gospel go forward, the restored gospel, and it's gone to help the poor and needy. And, you know, I think that when you got to sell off a heritage you've given up your birthright and it's it's very sad i mean i i got tears in my eyes right now just talking about it because i wonder what's next i wonder if they're gonna somehow get sell the auditorium are they gonna sell the stone church i don't know they're selling buildings all over the country churches uh we got friends all over different states and they're selling so many of the the community of christ churches they just sold one in Maine. I just talked to a friend yesterday in Maine. They just sold it in Maine, on Stonington, Maine. Um, they're selling campgrounds, everything. And it, what's so sad about it is they don't hesitate to say it's going into our retirement funds. You would think the Community of Christ people that are still there would figure it out. That's yeah. not really. And, and well, I'll tell you what, I, I wouldn't be surprised in the days ahead, now that they've sold the manuscript to the to the LDS Church of the Book of Mormon, and now they've got the inspired version, I, I'm wondering how long, I don't know, I'm just wondering how long they'll even continue to use anything but the uh, New International Version of the Bible. That, that's what I think they use, isn't it? One of the- Last I checked, it was but, Revised Standard. Uh, revised or, Standard. Yeah. But, I'm just saying, I, I see in the near future, Inspired Version, Book of Mormon, probably DNC going away. 
they've already started, I know, to step away from them. And I want to say, I know that this is Cheryl and Dan with really raw, fresh feelings, me as a member of the LDS Church, them as members of the Restoration Branches. If there are any Community of Christ listeners who would like to reach out to me and like to come and kind of talk to me from your perspective, I'm very open to hearing it and sharing it. I think this is a valid perspective as well, because because Cheryl, you at least, I know, Dan, you you converted later, I believe. Cheryl, your family heritage is in the RLDS church. So RLDS, what's so difficult that the, the, the right. RLDS church? Well, we were both. First we okay. were in the church and then into the reorganization. Yeah. Okay. But, but you were, anyway, I guess what I'm feeling is that you are stakeholders in this. This is your heritage. Like somebody who was raised in the... LDS church and then felt kicked out, but still believed and they sell the temple and they sell the, you know, like this. And, and it's just to pay the retirements of the employees and the leaders. That isn't, I can, I can see why that, because you're like, this was ours. This is not just yours. I feel that way about my church with my leaders. It's not just your church to do whatever you want with it. It's all of ours. And this is a really palpable example of that. Well, on the Community of Christ website last night, they they have a chat thing, and there were several people that are in the Community of Christ that are very very upset, and okay. they said they said, I don't understand where just the quorum of twelve yes. get the authority to do this. This should have been voted on in all the quorums and then brought to the general conference to be voted on by the people, and that didn't happen, and that's against the law of the church. Oh, that. That's a good you know can, I, can I just say that, like, if we have a big company or an investment house or bankers and they sort of in their under their management, their organization goes into the ground, you know, gets run down to where they can't afford their retirements. People would be pretty angry at them still taking their retirements when their bad management oversaw the failure of their organization. And so in a way, if you can't afford your retirements because of ha what happened under your management, maybe you don't get your retirement rather than you sell the properties that are the heritage of the organization you were entrusted to oversee. That seems like a valid, I, I would imagine many Community of Christ people maybe feel quite betrayed and upset about it. They're this. heartbroken. Lots of them are heartbroken. I got a phone call last night from a friend and uh, he was telling me quite a bit. He's in the restoration, but he got a call from a, a person that told him a bunch of stuff that's in the community of Christ. And it's, she's heartbroken. And so is her best friend. They just can't believe it that this has happened because it goes against the law. We're, we're told in our, in the organization that we are supposed to be doing our things by the voice of the people, not the voice of the quorum of 12. And that did not come to the general conference. And I'm sure if it had, if it would have probably been voted down. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. I think a lot of, I think this is, has, has woken a lot of the community Christ people up that have been sleeping for 40 years. You okay. know? So I have one more question on this topic about the selling of the properties. What is your feeling about the LDS church, what do you think might happen? What is your hope? What is your fear? I don't know. I, you know, I'm not in, um, I, I'm curious to know how sort of the community of Christ members and the restoration branch members view the LDS church as a steward. And what do you anticipate may happen? What do you hope may happen? And what do you fear may happen? Well, I, like I said earlier, I think, you know, I'm trying to look Look in the future. The Lord knows everything. And so I don't, I think if the COC would have kept it, they just didn't have the funds to, to preserve those things the way they should be and taken care of the way they should be. And I think the Lord's looking ahead and he's taken care of these things, you know, and he's, he's allowed this to happen so that they can be preserved. And all these things are in the Lord's hands. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I think, just like we talked about, and I think the last podcast, the Temple Lot Church was going to build a temple on the Temple Lot. And they had a big hole dug for the foundation or whatever. 
and I, I can't remember if they ran out of money or what happened. And someone told me or recently that the RLDS church, and I could be wrong on this, but it could be right, actually had to give them the money to fill the hole back in. Oh, okay. And so, it did, so obviously, you know, all things are in the Lord's hands, and and He's taken care of His. These really belong to Him, right? All this, everything belongs to the God. And so, I just don't think that the COC would be able to. They would crumble to the ground because they just don't have the finances to take care of those properties. And so, I think, I think the Lord's involved with this, where He's preserving those properties and the LDS church are going to be the ones uh, that that's going to preserve them. The Lord will use to preserve them. He controls everything. So I don't, I don't have any fears of anything. Uh, everything's in the Lord's hands and we just have to trust, trust that, you know, and I, I truly believe the LDS people church will, will take care of those things properly the way they should be. So that's probably okay. what happened. And I, I feel, like I've said before, Michelle, that right now, all of the factions of the restoration are in a big mess. And I believe it's only Jesus Christ that's going to be able to set this mess in order, just like he did in Third Nephi. And he's going to say, there's not any going to be any more contention or, or a division over the points of my doctrine. And at some point, I think, like Danny just said, the Lord is using the LDS church right now to hold on to those things. Because who knows where they would have ended up? So at okay. some point, I truly believe we will all be together again in God's perfect timing. Okay, I love that. And yes, I do want to just two quick things. John Hayacek did point out a very important distinction between preservation and restoration. And he really hopes they will be preserved, not restored. And then I think the big nightmare scenario, which I don't see happening, but I think that some people are concerned about as like the worst case scenario is that the LDS church changes the Kirtland temple into a functioning LDS temple that requires recommends and that um, would would kind of divide and exclude. And I, I, I'm, I really don't think that will happen. So, but those are the things that we are trying to say, please preserve, don't restore, <laughs> right? One and, and please make them open, welcome, and unifying rather than sectarian, sectarian with their, that they're just LDS and divisive. Michelle, I thought I'd read something coming from the LDS church in Utah that that's what they plan on doing. Okay, good. Uh, with Kirtland Temple and that it's going to reopen like March 25th, something like that, and free to go into and from what I where I'm read, that's what the plans are now. Anyway, to keep them the way they are for historical purposes and allow anyone to okay. go in and free tours, no charge for people who want to go in. So we'll see. Hopefully, it stays that way. What I wanted to say, Michelle, is a lot of the documents now that they've gotten in the LDS Church. I'm just thankful that Pam and Richard Price has done so much research and got documents, you know, and references in their books, because who knows what's going to happen to some of those documents Yeah, that tell, that tell things, you know, that they don't want people to know. You know what I mean? I got a little well, I am, I am so thankful for the Joseph Smith Papers Project and the greater transparency. I wish that we had full trust in it. I wish that there wasn't the concern about some things disappearing or being changed or misfiled. That seems to be an ongoing, you know, I, I guess I just always want to make my plea to the Joseph Smith Papers historians and the church leaders overseeing that to please earn our trust. <laughs> Don't let things disappear or be taken away. Put everything up. Yes. And I agree with you. I'm glad that there is the record that the prices have done. Go ahead, Dan. Well, I think this is a good time to share a testimony that I think everyone will appreciate hearing. And this man's name is J.C. Clapp. And I'm going to read you a little something here. Because of the spirit of persecution, my parents moved to Missouri and settled at Far West, where on August 24, 1837, I made my first appearance. So he's born 1837. Uh, this just goes to show you how the Lord... He sees everything. He sees everything and he provides for everything. Uh, when I was a child, I was blessed by the prophet Joseph Smith. Could you imagine having your baby blessing by the prophet wow. Joseph Smith? 
the prophet placed his own name and the name of his brother Carlos upon me, Joseph Carlos Clapp, okay? And made a prophecy to the effect that I shall preach the gospel. The language was that I should bear the gospel banner. And even upon the islands of the sea, I should lift up the standard of truth. Okay? Now keep that in mind. Divine healing. Dr. Peacock of San Bernardino pronounced me suffering from dropsy of the heart. After he made a thorough diagnosis of my case, he said he could do nothing for me. Brother Alexander H. Smith and William Anderson, I, he must have been in the organization at this time, by this time. Brother Alexander H. Smith and William Anderson came and administered to me, and I got better. But when they left, I relapsed into the same condition. I got so much worse that everyone despaired of my recovery. Dr. Peacock said I could live only a few days at most. I also felt that life was fast ebbing away. My heart seemed to be drowning in fluid, and it was struggling very hard. I told mother that I thought the end was coming. I said that I was not afraid, only I regretted very much that my life had been so wasted. I saw my mother and sister Nanny, a girl about 14 years of age, standing with streaming eyes. All at once, Nanny stepped up to our mother and said, Mother, in the name of the Lord, be comforted, for Joseph is not going to die at this time. She then turned to me and delivered one of the most soul piercing prophecies I had ever heard in my life, 14-year-old girl here. She said, quote, Verily, thus saith the Lord, thy sickness is not unto death, for I have a work for thee to do. Remember his baby blessing? He preached the gospel. A mission for thee to perform. Thy voice shall be heard in the congregation of the wicked and upon the islands of the sea. Thou shalt lift up the standard of truth. Tens of thousands shall hear thy testimony, and thousands shall be made glad because of thy ministry. The words from a bashful little girl were so powerful that it seemed the very foundations of the house trembled. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about him here in a little bit. So you got a little, okay. little background there. But I want, to, okay. I want to share something before I go into Mark Forskett. Yep. So about 15 years ago, I was talking to my aunt on the phone. And uh, she knew we were RLDS. She's 90 right now. She's still alive. My uncle's gone, but she's still alive. And we were talking on the phone. And she just out of the clear blue, she says, you're RLDS, right? And I said, yes. She goes, have you ever heard of a name Heber C. Kimball? And I'm like, uh, yeah, he was a man in the early church and, and he went you know, west with Brigham Young. She goes, yes, I know that. And, and I said, why do you ask? She says, well, I'm the great, great granddaughter of Heber C. Kimball by uh, one of his polygamous wives. And my great grandfather was the son of Heber C. And he, when he was 18 years old, he escaped and left Utah. And he went all the way to North Georgia and settled there. And he got a job and worked until he saved up enough money to get a lawyer. And he changed his name from Kimball to Kimbrell, K-I-M-B-R-E-L-L, -L, because he did not want anybody to know that he was related to Heber C. Kimball in any way. And he joined the Baptist church and all of her family to this day have been Baptists because he didn't want anybody to know that he was the great, you know, that, you know, he was the son of Heber C, because what he had experienced growing up 
in his polygamous family was so horrible, he didn't want any of his children to ever be raised in that. And that's wow. what she told me. Yeah. That's so interesting. Okay. So it must have been pretty bad. Well, I know we do have a variety of stories and people that want to defend it. There were people who had it less bad than others, shall we say, right? Yeah. But we shouldn't yeah. ignore the stories just because they don't go well with our narrative. I'm, I'm talking to my fellow church members. Just because stories don't go with our narrative or because we haven't heard them repeatedly our entire lives doesn't mean they aren't valid and don't need to be considered. So these stories, this woman's family heritage that you just shared is as valid as any of the rest of our family heritage stories that we've that have been passed down. And so it is It is important to I consider I was shocked. Them. Uh, Michelle, I was totally shocked when she shared that with me because I had never heard of that. You know, she never shared it with my mom or anything up until that point. But all of a sudden, she just That's a, wanted to tell I just, me. I'm just, I want to back up to this last topic because I'm just having some thoughts that are so interesting to me. In many ways, the LDS church, in my view, and some people push back on me on this, but in my view, it's kind of been in a pattern of repentance in many ways since the early founding. We stopped the blood atonement. We stopped the polygamy. We stopped the racism. We, you know, and, and, and the temple recently has been adjusted again and again to get us further away from some of those negative elements. I find that interesting. And at the same time, the RLDS church, when in, which in many ways with Joseph the Thirds and Emma's heritage and Joseph the Third's stewardship seemed to be more right, more in line with much of what Joseph Smith did and taught. And then they seem to have kind of gone the other direction when they, you know, started to go away from the Book of Mormon, away from the testimony of Joseph Smith into these things. And and I anyway, I just find that to be interesting that here we're in this situation where you guys talked about last time how the seeds of what have, has happened now with the um, community of Christ selling all the properties were really sown when they liberalized and and your congregation Cheryl and others that were the congregations that paid all of the tithing left and that set up the situation now to where it's gotten to the point where they financially can't even afford the basics of what they do and the LDS church that's been a little bit more on a repentant process I can't say that we've gotten there but do, do you know what I mean we're going kind of different directions to where now it seems the LDS church is the steward of these properties. Does that make sense to you? Like, I think God's, God's done this. He took them away from, you know, and yeah. the well, Lord saw that they were going to take care of it. I, and you made such a good point in our last conversation. And then we will get, go back into the, um, the stories of, I mean, we could call this a set episode escape from Utah or something <laughs> like that. But, so we'll get back into that. But the other point you made in our last conversation that I wanted to bring up again, cause I thought it was so good is that I, when I grew up and first heard about the temple lot church, I was like, what a silly church, a church exists just to be the temple lot church. But you, you know what I mean? And I didn't know much about it. That was just my first thought. But I loved your insight last time that you felt like they had an extremely important role, which was to preserve that spot. Because if the RLDS church, even though they won the legal case, the temple lot case, the judge decided in favor of the RLDS church regarding Joseph's polygamy. But because of squatters rights, the um, Temple Lot Church was able to maintain retain that property, which prevented the RLDS Church from building the temple. And so that temple spot has been preserved because decades later, the RLDS Church would, in different ways, the, I guess the community of Christ now, but the RLDS Church at your time betrayed their heritage. And so it's good they don't have a temple there. Anyway, I just see God's hand working in such fascinating ways through all of this. I agree. I agree. Okay. Let's go down the path of early Utah. Okay, let's go. Let's go down the path. I'll put my glasses on. So I can, so <laughs> okay. Can While okay. you're putting your glasses on, I will say when I was growing up, I thought, and, and when I started, when I was a young homeschooling mom, I really thought early Utah was the righteous place. And we are trying to be as righteous as those pioneer saints. And we're trying to get back there. And as I studied more and more and found out, it was a theocratic nightmare. It was a horror show. 
it it was bad, bad, bad news. So that's what Cheryl and Dan are going to help us understand a little bit more about. Michelle, just real quick, it, what, what you're not going to look at, uh, uh, Charles Derry's reasons for leaving Utah, it's about a four-page document. He uses the word of oppression 12 different times. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I sent you those references if you want to look it up on the internet. Yep. It's we will have, Cheryl has sent me uh, several links that will be below where you can get sources that are available online. Also, we'll have the links to the different books that you guys utilize and additional reading you suggest from the Restoration Bookstore or other places that we can get them. So please check the, least, the links below because this is a fascinating part of our history that we need to understand. Okay. So today, Danny and I are going to talk on John Brush. Danny's going to do him. And then J.C. Clapp. And then... I'm going to do Mark Forskett right now. Um, and I'm going to do Charles Derry And, Derry and also. Charles Derry and Mark Forskett, even though they both went to Utah, they ended up both escaping and later on came into the organization and they were traveling companions going out doing missionary work. Wow. So Mark Forskett, he was born in England and uh, he was the son of Robert and Amy Forskett. They were a very religious family. At 17, Mark went off to Cambridge College University, and um, one night some of his uh, friends from college said, hey, there's some Mormons down the street. Uh, they're going to preach tonight. Let's go down here and, and harass them is what they were going to do. Well, Mark goes, and he ended up filling the spirit because Danny and I, in our research we've been doing here lately, the one thing that we've noticed over and over and over is that Brigham Young had told all the men that were going to, to England or Scandinavia or whatever countries they were, that when you go, you preach the gospel. And then once they're converted, you tell them they need to gather to Zion, meaning Utah. And once they get here, we'll tell them the rest. So, Mark, under that, he heard the gospel. He knew by the Holy Spirit that it was true. So he ends up joining the, the LDS church, you know, over in England. And uh, his parents, especially his father, disowned him, totally disowned him. Well, he during, so he moved out from his parents' house and, and so forth. And then he met a young lady. Her name was Elizabeth Unsworth. They ended up getting married in uh, March of 1860, and from there, uh, they, they went to the United States. She ended up joining the church as well, and they got to Florence, Nebraska. And when they got there, I'm just going to read what he says here. Brother Holt came over from Omaha and asked if there were any saints from Bolton there. My mother and a friend were. He said, well, well girls, I preached Mormonism in Bolton for many years, and now I'll tell you what it is in Utah. He and his wife did so. The girls, knowing his integrity, believed and would have gone no farther. But Father could not be convinced. He thought Brother Holt a disgruntled old man. So this Brother Holt was warning them what really that he had been in Utah and had left. Mother said, what was a bride to do except to obey her husband? As soon as an escort of wagons came, they started on the long road to Salt Lake, pushing and, pushing and pulling hand carts. They made it to Salt Lake City on August 27, 1860. Shortly after arriving there, Father was made secretary to Brigham Young. It did not take him long to see that Brother Holt was correct in his diagnosis of affairs in Utah, except they were worse than he had painted. Before long, the leaders tried to have Mark wed another woman and even picked out the lady for him. He came home and said, Elizabeth, you alone can save me. How, she said, by asking some, by asking some demand that I cannot perform and sticking to it. They say a man has to have his first wife's consent, and I'll hold him to that. All right, she said. You tell Brigham that when you furnish me a home, 
and one year's provisions, you can marry whom you please. Father went to the office and told Brigham what she had said. Brigham sent two of his apostles to remonstrate with her. And when they failed, he visited her himself. Brigham went to the house. He, he talked and talked. And at last he asked if she did not want celestial glory for herself and Mark. Here's what, listen to this. I love this. I would have loved to met this woman. So Elizabeth says to Brigham right to his face. I'm not worrying about any kind of glory, she replied, but I want a home and provisions for a year, then Mark can do as he pleases. We will build you a house, said Brigham, but you know we can't provide provisions for a year. Well, I've given you my ultimatum, so there is no use talking. I would have loved to met her. <laughs> Brigham Young went back to the office quite angry and told father that he should marry anyhow. But father told him that he could not do so without her consent. About six months after arriving there, they both left the Utah Mormon Church and soon joined the Morrisites and made their headquarters in Weber, where Mark taught school. In the fall of 1861, a call was issued for the male residents of South Weber to appear at Kingston Fort to enroll and drill. I guess Brigham had started some kind of an army. Uh, the day of training came and not a Morrisite mustered. Instead, they repaired to the Bowery. So uh, they're in this church and uh, his wife, she stopped by a chair and leaned on it looking for father. John Cook came in carrying a three-legged stool, motioned for her to come and sit on it. She went over and as she sat down, a cannonball came in, killed the woman on whose chair she had been leaning, killed another, and shot through the jaw of a girl. Joseph Morris and John Banks were also killed at this time. Mr. R. Cook advised them, go quietly to your homes and let each man defend his own family as best he can. So they go, they go and they, they're hiding in the cellars or, or in their home. And, and, it's, and Elizabeth is really concerned if Mark is a dead or alive. And she was told that he was taken prisoner. But that, that really wasn't it. Um, so it says, uh, in the meantime, Mark became an apostle in the Morrisite Church. And he had taken the records and made his way stealthy to Elizabeth's brother's home, which was just a short distance from the camp. He got back to the camp shortly after dark and found his loved ones safe. In uh, October of 1862, Colonel Connor and the Californian volunteers came into Utah. Father joined them and became the private secretary for Colonel Connor. Father joined the organized church while in Salt Lake City. And as, and as long as he stayed there, meaning in uh, Camp Douglas, uh, he was never worried at all. But then... <laughs> Can I fill in really quickly? Because I was wondering what year this was. And when you're talking about the Morrisites and that bomb, I mean, that cannon, which I've never heard about that. And if anyone is curious about it, because it's always good to be able to validate these sources, sources, go ahead and look up the Morrisite War and you will get a lot more information on this. There was, you can find a Wikipedia article and a lot more information about the Morrisite War that validates this, this, um, history that Cheryl is reading. So I just wanted to throw that in there that even if you haven't heard of it, look it up because that's verification. Okay, continue. So uh, as long as, as Mark was in the army there in uh, Utah, in, uh, he was fine. But in September of 1866, he was, he was discharged. And um, then he's, you know, they're back out on their own now. And uh, so what, on a Monday, August 31st, 1866, Mother went to get her scrub brush and found it laid upon the kitchen window. Upon taking it up, she discovered a paper which had gone, sorry, which had one gun printed on one side and a pistol on the other, each with bullets pouring out. Written in red ink were, the, were these words, Mark H. Forskett. If not out of this territory within one week, thou shalt die the death of a miserable apostate dog. Elizabeth came in so worried, but Mark ridiculed the idea. 
That night, Elizabeth dreamed the same dream twice, that Mark came into the room shot. The next morning, she urged him to leave. She told him she would get the money that he must go, or she would go wild. So she sold a bunch of stuff so she could get the money. Well, Mark goes down. He decides, okay, I'm going to do it. So he goes down to get a ticket to get out of there on the stagecoach, or yeah, I guess it was stagecoach. He goes down there, and he gets a ticket, and the only ticket that supposedly was available was for on a Monday morning. Well, he had made a friend of an Army officer in the camp, and this Army officer happened to mention to him, you know, I'm leaving on Friday. I got a ticket for Friday to get out, you know, to I'm going somewhere. And so Elizabeth asked him, would you mind switching tickets with Mark? Because if he waits till Monday, they're going to kill him. And so the officer said, okay, I'll, I'm not in no big hurry. I'll, I'll do that. So they exchanged stagecoach tickets. So Mark actually left on Friday. Okay. And they left, they left, and there was no problem at all. He got Mark got out of there, left his wife and kids still in Utah. Uh, but he got on the stagecoach, and he went on back to ne Nebraska. And that and, must have uh, terrified him to leave his family there. Like, a her terrible he told, he, His okay. wife, Elizabeth, said that she had the assurance from God that the children and her would be safe and that as okay. soon as possible she would get, would be there following, And which that's what happened. So anyway, he gets on the stagecoach and he gets out of there. That was on Friday. Well, then on Monday, now the Army guy is on the stagecoach that Mark would have been on. So he's... They're going down the road. They get about three miles out of out of Utah, out of Salt Lake, and the next thing you know, avenging angels show up and stop the stagecoach, and they say, "I want everybody off." This was it. This was in the evening time. It was dark, and they had lanterns. They said, "We want everybody off the stagecoach," and they made everybody get off. They took the lanterns, held them up, the lantern to each person that got off face. And the head guy turned around to the rest of the Avenging Angels and said, he's not on the stagecoach. Everybody get back on the stagecoach and, and uh, leave because, you know, you can leave because he's not on here. He'd already gone. Thank goodness that army guy switched tickets with him or he would have been killed. And so um, anyway, and not very long after that, then his wife, Elizabeth, and their kids, they, they ended up going on to Nebraska. And he ended up becoming a missionary in the um, RLDS church along with Charles Derry. But uh, this other one that I'm gonna share uh, talks about the f a family that was also in Weber, Weber uh -huh. and yeah. Mark Forscott was their children's school teacher there. He taught school there in okay. Weber. Okay. So, so, but anyway, that's, that's okay. uh, the Avenging Angels. They were gonna kill him on that Monday and in the, in the whole transcript. And, and if anybody wants to, just go to the links that I sent Michelle, and you can go to latterdaytruth.org, and their whole his whole diary is on here. It's several pages long. You can either read it on there or printed it out like I did. But um, um, I just you know I wanted to condense it down because it's really long. But anyway, so God God spared his life because of the dreams that his wife had to get out now, or, he, or you would be dead on Monday. And it even says in the in the big transcript that um, they knew, the way they, the way they knew it is at that time the stagecoach company was owned by Brigham and all them in the church. Oh, so, oh wow, okay. So they knew that they, did, they wouldn't sell him a ticket for any other day. They wanted to, him to be on that Monday stagecoach so they could kill him. Wow, okay. And this is, this was after um, Mountain Meadows. So this was not, like like, it wasn't like, Mountain Meadows scared them into repentance about these doctrines and these teachings. It was a continuing pattern that was still happening. That's incredible. And I, I'm no noticing an interesting pattern that seems to be maybe consistent throughout these stories you're going to tell us. It seems that the LDS church, the Brighamite um, Utah-based church, was more successful at sending missionaries abroad. And so a lot of people, they would go abroad, convert people to the gospel, not telling them, like we, we know that John Taylor went and read section 101 in the original Doctrine and Covenants 
to to say no we're not living polygamy when they were to after 1852 right so then the people would convert come to utah realize the horror show it was and then eventually find the rlds church right because that was the restoration they had been converted to that that had that shared that gospel at least much of that gospel but didn't have the same awful practices is that does that seem to be what happens consistently you're way yeah. ahead of me. You're way ahead of me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll wait. I'm going to read something just, to you here in a minute. I told Danny. Support what you're saying. I told Danny that, uh, so I can just make this statement one time, that almost all the accounts that we're going to share, that people ended up coming into the organization, but there were a few that, that I've read that they were so tired of it and what they'd been through because they'd been through Far West and Nauvoo and, they were done. And once they escaped Utah, they were done. Yeah. So the majority of them went with the organization. Okay. Okay. And I can sympathize with that. I mean, not an easy time to live in this restored gospel that then turned into this nightmare. Yeah. You need to scoot over closer. Yeah. At the end of the reasons for leaving Utah, uh, Charles Derry says this, thousands that have left Utah when they see this will remember a great number of evils practiced that are not recorded here. But I think enough is written to show that oppression is their modus operandi and ambition, power, and lust, the objects at which they aim. Okay, wow. He says okay. thousands can testify to what, what he has said, but like I said, you're 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 way ahead of me. Dan, can you can you scoot a little closer to Cheryl? Don't be shy. <laughs> you can pull your it's because I'm looking at this screen over here. Okay, oh, okay, you go ahead. That's why I'm getting over here. But uh, anyway, the title of this document and it goes along with what you just said. Doctrines and dogmas of Brighamism are <laughs> unlike the doctrine that was taught and accepted by the Church from 1830 to 1844. Okay, now I'm going to quote. This is from Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, page 279. It's Brigham Young, August 29, 1852. When the elders, this is the quote, when the elders first commenced preaching Mormonism 20 years ago, they would take the Bible and prove every item of doctrine to the people beyond doubt and controversy. Okay, that's the way it should be. Okay. When I, this is uh, John Taylor, it's in Journal Discourses, Volume 15, page 286 and 287, January 12, 1873, John Taylor. When I and my brethren have gone out to preach the gospel, we have told the people precisely the same things as were taught in former times by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now remember what you just said, Michelle. What is it that has brought you Latter-day Saints here, meaning to Utah? It is the principles of the gospel. You heard them perhaps in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, France, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Germany, or some other parts of the earth. No matter where you heard them, when you did hear, you believed them. Okay, so they're teaching the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, this is uh, Jedediah M. Grant, again from Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, page 231, 232, December 17, 1854. Well, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. No matter how near men may preach the gospel, they must, pre must preach the same gospel. Every part of it, every ordinance of it, every principle Jesus Christ revealed and his apostles taught. If they do not, they teach another gospel. And if they teach another, says the apostles, apostle, let them be accursed. The gospel preached by Joseph Smith is the same that is contained in the New Testament and which was preached by Jesus Christ and his apostles. And it is the power of God to everyone that believes. So it will be evident that there was a change in thinking from what was stated above. This is Journal Discourse, Volume 1, page 78, Brigham Young. And I'll send you this document if, if we haven't already sent it, so you'll, you'll have it. Uh, Brigham Young, September 11, 1853. This is a quote. 
Brigham Young, if I have any knowledge touching the condition of this people at the present time and the way they are taught, led, counseled, and dictated by those who go before them to open up the way, it is directly opposite of that we saw in the days of Joseph the prophet. Directly opposite. Wow, and okay. Read up here by Jedediah Grant that the gospel preached by Joseph Smith is the same that's contained in the New Testament, which was preached by Jesus and his apostles. That's mm -hmm. what was Joseph was like. It is directly opposite of that we saw in the days of the prophet Joseph. So like you said, people being converted all over the world by the preaching of the gospel, then they come to Utah and what they're being taught, according to Brigham Young, is directly opposite of that we saw in the days of Joseph the prophet. Okay, this is Gerald, yeah, this is Gerald Discourses, volume 14, page 277, Brigham Young, July 3rd, 1870. Now to the Latter-day Saints, I will say that when you receive the gospel in foreign lands, you receive no more in comparison than a child receives at school when mm -hmm. he learns the first lesson, which must be the gospel that he's talking about, the principles of the gospel. If he masters the alphabet, he thinks he is progressing finely. If the saints receive the alphabet abroad, they're doing well. When they come here, they have more to learn. Okay. Okay, yeah. Can I can I finish that that I was so curious about that directly opposite quote that I hadn't looked it up. I just want to read the sentence after that if that's okay while well, you're looking up your next one. If I have any knowledge touching the condition of this people at the present time and the way they are taught, led, counseled, and dictated by those who go before them to open the way, it is directly opposite of that we saw in the days of Joseph the prophet. He was full of sorrow, trouble, poverty, and distress. But now the people are led into riches by the example, counsel, advice, and dictations of their leaders. They are on the highway to wealth. Wow, that's a, I hadn't, I hadn't read that one yet. Okay, continue on yeah, with the next one. Thanks yeah, for letting me add to that. Uh, George Albert Smith, this is uh, Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, page 218 and 220, uh, March 18, 1855. I tell you, we're in the middle of a big turnpike, and if we continue in the keys of exaltation uh, are with us, and the great work of God will unfold to this people, things that have been hid from the foundation of the world. So now, you know, things that have been hid. The Lord in his mercy to us has given us a great prophet and wise ruler in Israel. I'm assuming he's referring to Brigham Young. That we may exert our powers, influence, and wisdom under his direction to prepare for the revelation of the law of exaltation, which has been so long promised. So here's something new uh, coming. Uh, let's see. Now, now we're getting beginning some people that have come to Utah are beginning, like I say, they're taught the gospel out there. They come to Utah. And now that we're starting to get some complaints. Uh, this is Journal of Discourses, volume two, page 332, George Albert Smith, June 24, 1855. We sometimes see men make their appearance among us. And after a short stay, they will say, quote, why I believe I will go off to some place and wait till ancient Mormonism comes around again. For this is not ancient Mormonism. These are not the, the original doctrines that were preached. Okay, starting again, this is Herbert C. Heber C. Kimball, uh, Journal Discourses, Volume 4, page 173. It's January 11, 1857. There are a great many old men who have the priesthood upon them who have been in the church from the beginning, and yet they are spiritually dead. What is the matter? I can expose them. I can tell you just what ails them and why they're spiritually dead. They do not wake up and cannot wake up because they do not consider that they are guilty of anything wrong. They cannot see themselves. But when you come to find out, you will find that they have, from the death of Joseph and before he was slain, murmured and complained at Brigham and Heber, saying that, quote, Mormonism is not as it was then. We knew and understood Mormonism when Joseph was alive, but we do not know the tree now. It has grown so fast. One more, maybe. Journal Discourses, Volume 5, page 307, Amasa M. Lyman, October 11, 1857. Apostates are found as we pass through the country, and they will say, quote, I knew the work to be true 20 years ago, 
when you, Brother Lyman, and or someone else came through our section of country and preached the gospel. See, preached the gospel. I knew that it was tr true then. Then why did you apostatize and leave the church? Have you found out that it was false? Quote, well, I do not know that I have, but it was that Mormonism that was preached 20 years ago that I knew. So, so you kind of get the idea. And then this is uh, Joseph F. Smith. I feel that I've spoken the truth to you. I ask you to receive it in good and honest hearts. It is found in the books. I assume he's talking about the Bible, Book of Mormon, and Doctrine and Covenants. But the books are the dead letter. It is the living oracles that have the right to organize and direct, to counsel and exhort, admonish and reprove. This is Joseph F. Smith. Uh, this Journal of Discourse is also, uh, volume three, page 197, Heber C. Kimball, January 27, 1856. I would not care if there was a Bible within 10,000 miles of this place or any other book of script. Here are the oracles living right in our midst, and we receive them from day to day by word of mouth from a living man, I'm assuming Brigham Young, an apostle who is alive and through a priesthood which is living in our midst. Joseph in his lifetime did not receive everything connected with the doctrine of redemption, but he has left the key with those who understand how to obtain and teach to this great people all that is necessary for their salvation and exaltation in the celestial kingdom of God. I have shown other brethren and sisters that Brother Joseph did not tell them all things at once. Consequently, you may expect to hear and see many things you never thought of before. Brigham Young, this is in Times and Seasons, volume six, page 955. That was 1845, right? Is that the 1845 sermon? We'll link them all below, yep. This is Brigham Young, Times and Seasons, volume five, page 666 and 667. I have known that Brother Marks, had no evidence but the written word. But if this people have no evidence but the written word, it is quite time to go to the river and be baptized for the remission of their sins. As to a person not knowing more than the written word, let me tell you that there are keys that the written word never spoke of, the written word meaning the scriptures, nor never will. Okay. So you can wow. see what the saints, after being converted by the preaching of the gospel, and then they get and one of these accounts somewhere, it said, we never heard a gospel sermon <laughs> once we got out there. So I'll, I'll, I'll send you this uh, document. But from there, and that supports what you said. That literally supports what you said. Yeah. This is another clap. And there's a lot of good history before this because a lot of, some of them went through uh, being expelled from Missouri and, you know, Adam on the Almond and far west and then Nauvoo, there's some good history in the beginning of some of these that we're not going to get into. But he says, we were expelled from Nauvoo in 1846. Our destination was supposed to be Upper California. While traveling through the Iowa Territory on our westward journey, we used to sing, quote, on the road to California. And, quote, in Upper California, that's the land for me. So uh, Rick, they were intending to go to California. We never thought of Salt Lake until the pioneers discovered the Salt Lake Valley. At that time, it belonged to Mexico, and Brigham Young decided to locate the church there and build up an empire of his own. And that's basically what happened. At the time of our exodus from Nauvoo, Iowa, was Indian territory and very sparsely settled. We settled in Counts Council Bluffs, then called Canesville, and also settled Florence, then called Winter Quarters, which is on the west side of the river in Nebraska. While we were located in this new country, the church, that portion of it, willing to follow Brigham Young, was reorganized. Brigham Young was made the president and declared the successor of the martyred prophet. I remember the effect upon many, especially my father, who claimed that the church was or would be rejected because they had, contrary to the law, made Brigham Young president without any revelation from God. From that time, and, and, and reading another place, of, uh, Brigham said it was a choice of the people, and that's sufficient. Yeah. Uh, I don't have that quote right here. But anyway, from that time until the day Father left Utah, he was never satisfied with the order of things then established. 
My father, having been in an adventurous disposition, went about 40 miles up the river, settled on the Iowa side in the large bend of the river, which we call Nettle Bend. And he enclosed kind of a thousand acres, he says, of fertile land. The country abounded in game, wild fruit, honey. If we had possessed sense enough to have stayed there, it would have been much better for us, both temporally and spiritually. And he wow, obviously okay. talked about it. We wouldn't have went on to. But anyway, it says, but since the saints were starting for the West again, we were swallowed up in the general desire to go with the church. We did not start till spring of 1850. I was then only 12 years old, but I drove a team of four yoke of oxen from Council Bluffs to Salt Lake City over 1,000 miles. Our large train uh, made traveling slow, and we were caught in the snowstorms of the mountains. This caused much suffering among the people, especially since quite a number of them were very poor and ill-prepared for such a journey, much less for the severe winter. Cholera and mountain fever made heavy demands upon us, and we left many little unmarked mounds as the resting places of loved ones. We've, we've, some of these saints made great sacrifices when they was coming from Europe. Cheryl's uh, re reading something the other day that they're on a, on a ship, you know, a boat bringing them over, and a couple of their, maybe she's going to tell this. Are you? Yeah. Okay, I'll let her tell it then. I was just well, I don't want to get ahead. He's of still in my. I'm still on her thunder here. Okay, but anyway, we finally reached the quote promised land, Salt Lake Valley, where we were assured that our new Zion, in our new Zion, we would be free from Gentile interference, and where mobs could never molest or make us afraid. So now the experiences in Utah is the title. As early as the fall of 1850, Brigham Young began to encourage the idea of temple building. He called for volunteers to haul rock from Red, I'm not sure if it's Butte Canyon or mm -hmm. Red, Red Butte Canyon, okay, uh, to build the temple. This canyon was five or six miles east of the city, and workers could easily make a load in a day. My father, always ready to help in work of that kind, remember, they're doing this for the temple, put together two teams to haul rock. A number of other brethren did of the same without payment, of course. I suffered considerably as it fell to my lot to drive a team. The weather was cold and we were very poorly clad, but we were hauling rock to build, quote, the house of the Lord. And we drew considerable comfort from that. This rock hauling was the first eye-opener my father got in Utah. Despite his dissatisfaction with Brigham's seizing authority, father was still zealous in supporting the church to a very great degree. He was greatly surprised when Brigham made the announcement that the rock was not suitable for the temple. But, said the leader, we have not lost anything, for we need a place where we can have fun and kick up our heels. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So the wily chief took the rock that was hauled for the temple and built the Salt Lake Theater. Yeah. When it was completed, it belonged to Brigham. Mm -hmm. okay. The next eye-opener on temple building was a call for all the faithful to dig a canal from Big Cottonwood Canyon to Salt Lake City to move rock down from the mouth of the canyon. Every ward was called out, and a portion of the canal was assigned to each ward. My brother William and I each worked 53 days on the canal. Although the work was hard and the weather cold, we were happy in the thought that we were to have a, a, a quote, name in the house of the Lord. Imagine our surprise after we'd got a good stream of water running in the canal to receive word from headquarters that it would not be practicable to run rock down the canal to the city. But again, said the chief, we have lost nothing for we need the water. They abandoned that project, but they did not abandon the canal. It was useful to irrigate Brigham's big farm and turn the water mill just south of the city. My father got a land grant for Big Cottonwood Canyon. This is a good one here, which at the time was considered impenetrable on account of rattlesnakes and the granite rock that almost shut up the canyon for about a quarter of a mile. Father was an enterprising man, and not fearing the rattlesnakes or the granite rock, 
he preserved, he persevered and made the road. We killed thousands of snakes in the process, rattlesnakes. After we had exhausted our means and opened up the way to the to perhaps the first body of timber in that territory, Brigham came to my father and began to flatter him. He said, quote, Brother, Brother Benjamin, you are one of the most thorough men in this territory. If I had 1,000 men like you, nothing could keep me out of the presidential chair of these United States. Boy, he was laying it on thick, wasn't he? There is not another man in the territory who could have done what you have done. Brother Clapp, now we, now it's we, now it's we, Brother Clapp, we have got to have that timber out of that canyon. As you have not the means to get it out, I propose to take this thing off your hands and let you rest. <laughs> this he did and made millions out of it. Yeah. Wow, selling the timber that, okay. Yeah. Quote, but Brother Benjamin said Brigham, I tell you in the name of the Lord that you shall in no wise lose your reward. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. On account of seeing so much hypocrisy during the Reformation in Utah, my brother William and I would not be rebaptized. Of course, we were looked upon as rebellious apostates, that no doubt was the cause of much that I suffered in later years. In the spring of 1856, I made up my mind to fulfill a covenant that I had made with my mother. My father at this time was living with his second wife. Great. I had seen mother's tear scald cheeks and heard her sobs until I thought I could be burned alive if it would be any of service to her. I told her that if I ever got big enough, I would take care of her and never forsake her as long as we both lived. One morning early in April, I resolved to throw off the yoke. I knew it was a desperate undertaking, for my father was an austere man and, and a born ruler. I summoned all the courage I could and prayed for strength that I might not falter, for, for I knew that the time had come for a change. I went trembling, tremblingly to my father, or rather he became, came to me and began to list work for me to do. I looked him in the face and said, Father, you will have to get someone else to do that. For after this, I'm going to work for my mother. Wow. I love this guy. Okay, yeah. I love that kid. Okay, prior to this time, I never even said I did not want to do what he told me to do. At this time, my oldest brother was in California and the next brother in Mexico. I was at home and I took upon me the responsibility of maintaining my mother and raising the other children, four girls and one boy, my father did not seriously object, and I felt much relieved. After getting a divorce for my mother, I located her in the 14th Ward and made arrangements to go to California. William Smith, who claimed to be a relative of the family, was going to take 1,000 head of cattle to California. The cattle were called, quote, church cattle, <laughs> but were branded B.Y. Yeah. <laughs> Went on his cattle drive to California, basically to get out of Utah, his excuse to get out. Yeah. And anyway, the guy that was running it ended up not paying any, anything. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, hiring on with Smith had been my scheme to get out of Utah and take my mother and her children away from there. I found, so he gets back to Utah. I found mother well, only in a little trouble with the ward officials of the church. I had written that I was coming to take the family away. The family had told of it. That was the mistake. And they were looked upon as apostates. I, of course, was branded on account of leaving the train that I left Salt Lake with, and we were in a bad position. However, I was warned by some of the members of the church to flee from the city or I would be killed. Goodness. Thing, an old lady who had been a neighbor to us in Nauvoo came to me and warned me to flee for my life. She had heard her husband and two others of the brethren planning to put me out of the way. I do not know that the lady told the truth, but subsequent events confirmed 
what she had said. It was not long after this that my father came to Camp Floyd. He had gotten into difficulty with some of the officials in southern Utah, and an attempt had been made to blood atone him. My father had been in the mission field nearly all his life and knew little of the dark deeds done at home. It was a policy of the leader to keep such men away as much as possible. When he came home and saw the condition of things, he was appalled and said altogether too much for his safety. He said too much. So you had to be careful of how you spoke. If you were going to leave or anything negative about the leadership, uh, your life was in danger. Uh, anyway, I think that's some of the highlights there. So I'll let Cheryl, there's a couple more things about the destroying angels, trying to get them, but I'll let Cheryl go ahead and do it. We got a long okay. way to go. Wow, these are amazing stories. Yeah. Well, the next one that I'm going to do, it's a book, but it's it was from the diaries. Uh, this lady here, her name is Iris Griffiths. She's the one that took her grandparents' diaries and wrote the book called The Vindicator. This book is out of print, but I gave Michelle the reference. You can probably get this through Paul Lady, Paul Ludy. Anyway, that's where I, this is my original, but I bought a few extra copies and gave them to some of my LDS friends. So I know he does have some. It's an excellent book, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to hit the highlights. So the couple that I'm going to talk about, John and Mary, this is them right here. Okay. That's great. Okay. John Griffiths, this Mary was his second wife. John Griffith and his wife, Dorothy, came from Wales. They'd heard the gospel in Wales, and they decided that they were going to go to Utah to be in Zion. Uh, Dorothy was ill before they left Wales, but they didn't really realize how bad she really was. And she gets on the ship, and on the voyage, um, she... Uh, ended up dying from consumption and lung hemorrhage and had to be buried at sea. Well, John, he was just totally devastated. And there was a, a family on that same boat and their last name was Thomas. And they were not, they had no intentions of going with the Mormons or anything. They were just coming to America to start a new life. And um, this Mr. Thomas, he had a daughter named Mary who was 24 years old and a son, Tommy, and a, a daughter, Hannah, and also Sally James and her sister, Lysitia. Uh Sally had cared for Mr. Thomas's wife before she died. So Thomas brought them with him to start a new life in America. Here you've got John losing his wife on the boat and had to be buried at sea. And then they, the ship they're on gets caught in a hurricane. And they thought it was going to go down too. But, I mean, these people that came from the British Isles and Scandinavia and stuff. They really, really went through so much. I just can't yeah. believe it. Anyway, they, they ended up, they landed in New Orleans and then they took a boat up the Mississippi River and the Thomas family was on the same boat. Well, when they got up to St. Louis, Thomas family got off. But on the meantime, on the boat, uh, now that John's wife had died, he was just so heartbreaking, broken, his heart was broken. And he decided uh, you know, that he just was beside himself. He didn't know what. But this Mary that was 24, this Mary Thomas, she tried to comfort him and everything during this time. And so they ended up falling in love on the boat. And so uh, when Mary got off the boat with her dad and, and the rest of her family in St. Louis, he was really devastated because he went on up the Missouri River and on up to Council Bluffs and up that way. Because he was going to go on the on a wagon train uh, out to Utah. Well, anyway, what happened was was Mary ended up uh, her and her brother. They ended up somehow talking to her dad, and they got to go to Utah. Later on, Mr. Thomas came out too, but uh, so Mary ended up joining the church. Well, when when uh, John got out to Utah, he just thought he got off, you know, got off the the wagon train and. Brigham Young was there to greet them and shake their hands and everything, you know, and welcome to Zion and, you know, everything's rosy posy here, you know, and, oh, uh, John just thought he was great. And uh, so then not too long after that, um, 
is when you know Mary came and and uh, he found her there, and they ended up getting married in Salt Lake in 1853. Okay, but let me go here. John got called the priesthood, and now that John was in the priesthood, it was hinted that he should take himself a number of wives in order to carry out the patriarch's prophecy that his posterity be numerous as the sands upon the seashore. Although polygamy had been denied publicly until a few months before, it had frequently been discussed among the church members, and the practice was admitted be before John by some of the elders and Brigham Young himself. The reasons for it were supposedly spiritual. On one occasion, when John was seeking more information about it, he was instructed to study more deeply certain chapters of the Bible as well as in the Book of Mormon. When he entered a higher order of the church, he would be able to understand the revelations and see that the Mormons were following the ways of Jesus Christ, the Father, and the Holy Ghost, he was told. John let it rest there, although he was not satisfied with their answers. So anyway, he didn't, he wouldn't take another wife. And so, um, he was, they started, you know, seeing that things were not right. Him and Mary started seeing things that were not right in the church. And their, the brother Tom, uh, he, I, I never really saw anything if he joined the church or not, but uh, he um, was more, John, John was, because he worked around a lot of the people in Salt Lake and stuff, a lot of people told him, do not say anything sarcastic. Don't uh, do anything where the hierarchy would maybe see that you are going to be an apostate. You know, don't say anything. Be careful. Well, Tom, Mary's brother, he was kind of cocky. And he was like, okay, he was warned over and over. Do not say anything. Or, you know, there's a chance that you're going to be killed. And so, no. um, anyway. Just the fact that they know this, the fact that they have to warn each other, you know, that that's the culture so much. Okay, keep going. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this town, but they lived in a place called Springville. Yep. If, yeah, Springville's not very far from me. Okay, so they lived in Springville. One day, uh, Tom was sent into Springville uh, to get something at a feed store. And while he was there... Tom noticed this beautiful young woman, his age. Uh, by this time, Tom was, you know, he wasn't 16 anymore. He was like 20 or so. Anyway, so he, he noticed this girl, a uh, young woman, and um, she was real pretty. And he, she looked at him, and he looked at her, and they smiled and everything. And uh, she was loading up this buckboard of grain, uh, doing all this labor. And he was going to go help her and stuff, you know. And then... All of a sudden, this old man comes out from the feed store and tells her, you know, hurry up and get done with that and get up on the wagon and all this and that. And they took off. Well, they both were kind of, you know, this woman and um, Tom were kind of attracted to each other. And, but he didn't know who she was. Well, a few days later, it was Sunday, and they, there was a church service going on there in Springville. And uh, as Tom, uh, the next Sunday, Tom rode past the church again and spotted the team, team in a wagon that looked familiar. He tied his horse and went in. The room was quite full. So he stood in the back and looked for the girl he had seen unloading the grain. He soon found her. She was looking toward him, and he could tell by her expression that she recognized him. Tom smiled and started toward her. But she quickly turned her head and put her hands up to shield her face as though she was afraid her looks might betray her feelings. Tom stepped back and stood at the rear of the church with a group of young men, thinking he would seek her out as soon as the meeting was over. Then he noticed that the man, the girl, was, the girl had called Jake that day at the warehouse, was sitting in the same row with her. There were several other older women seated between them. Tom whispered to one of the young men standing beside him, Could you tell me the name of that girl sitting on the bench to the left of us? 
He nodded his head in her, in her direction. The fellow followed Tom's gaze and whispered back, She's no girl. She's one of old man Jessup's wives. That's him on the other end of the seat, and all those women sitting between them are his wives too. So Jake Jessup was who the old man was. This news made Tom sick with disgust. It aroused in him both pity and hate. It was plain to see the girl was not happy. Tom was disappointed, but the feeling ran deeper than that. He felt as if he had been robbed of something. How was a young man to find himself a wife when all the girls were being sealed in marriage to these old men? These polygamists were getting bolder every day. As the meeting got underway, the members came before, became more and more emotional. Tom was about to leave, then decided to stay a while longer and watch what went on. He sat down near the back. Most of the congregation did not participate in the sealing of wives ceremony. The ones that did went to the altar, singing and praying and clapping their hands. Tom kept watching the girl. He, made, he had made up his mind that if she gave any indication she wanted his help, he would give it to her. But when she got up and joined the orgy, along with Jake and his other wives, it was more than Tom could stand. He was so riled that he forgot John's warning and rose up and shouted, Why don't you call it stealing wives instead of sealing wives? Someone in the crowd said, Amen. Oh, and that's several, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And several who heard Tom's comment began to laugh. The elder who was performing the rites was furious over the outburst and laughing. He said, Will the party causing the confusion in the back either get out or keep quiet? Everyone looked to the back of the room. Tom was already starting to leave. He turned at the door and said, I was, I was leaving on my own accord. I despise any organization that lures innocent young women, as, women astray. He stalked out. Outside, he mounted his horse and rode quickly away without looking back. Nevertheless, he was aware that three men had come from a back door and had run toward their horses. Tom knew that the men had not left the meeting for the same reason he had. Suddenly he remembered John's warning against starting any disturbance with the Brighamites. He knew the men were following him. So I'm going to skip forward here on this. So what happened was these three men were avenging angels and they were following him. Well, he knew that part of the country, I guess, better than they did. And he was able to get away and hide. And then at some point, he uh, uh, ended up going to, um, you know, Mary and John's house to and hide out for a while. And uh, he was okay for a while. Well, anyway, during that time, John and Mary actually witnessed the wagon train that was going through that ended up killing the people in Mountain Meadow Massacre. And okay. as the wagon train... This was a few days before that, but uh, when they saw the, the dust coming off the, the trail, all the people from that area, they, they went down to where the wagon train was and they, they would sell supplies to them, like, you know, canned goods or whatever they could do to, to make extra money and, and got to talking with the people and they liked them. You know, they liked a lot of the people that were heading to California on that wagon train. And it wasn't very long after that, that, um, they, they got news that that whole wagon train had been killed in Mount Meadow Massacre. And John knew, he knew, John refused, okay, this was a horrible thing to blame on the Mormons. John refused to believe it at first. Yet he knew there was a secret order in the church organized by the Brighamites to punish the reform those working against them. Its existence was denied, but everyone knew it. When this order was first organized, they were called the Danites. Then they became known as the Avenging Angels. They were violent, brutal men who did not hesitate to follow Brigham Young's orders. They were led to believe that they were performing a special duty and would be rewarded in the eyes of God. Well, anyway, John knew that it was them that did this and that Brigham was responsible. He, somehow he found out about it. 
So anyway, um, what happened was going on because I this book is pretty thick. Um, he ended up this Tom back to Tom. Tom was hiding out at their house, and uh, they got word that uh, the avenging angels were coming looking for him at John and Mary's, and so Tom had to escape, and uh, he ended up he got he 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 actually was able to get out. Uh, John and, and Tom were in the house and they had weapons and they were waiting and they knew that these were avenging angels. There was three of them and John actually was able to, he went off, Tom went off with them and actually was able to get away. So they got away and then uh, the next thing you know, after Tom flees and he gets away from Utah, um, now they're turning their anger toward uh, John and Mary. Mm -hmm. And so John knew that the only way that he could even get spared was uh, the call went out uh, to all the saints that they needed to get into the walled city in Utah because the, the U.S. Army was coming. And so they, he went there, and he didn't want to do it, but he went ahead and joined Brigham's army inside the camp because they took their wagon, their cows, their horses, everything they brought with them to the city, they were confiscated right there. They didn't, they didn't get to have it. And so, anyway, once he got on the inside and he, you know, signed up and all that, as long as he was in this army, you know, for the for Brigham, it was okay. But then what happened was, he knew he had to get out of there. He knew he knew they that they were never going to get out. And there was already rumors of people that uh, had been in there that had tried to get out that John knew that they killed. And it's all in this book. And they killed him. And it tells their names. Uh, but anyway, so... Do you have um, a rough idea? I'm just curious if you know around how many uh, don't look... Uh, let's see. What did I write that down here? Mean? Before John could decide what to do next, an old friend, a neighbor of theirs, John Lewes, L-E-W-E-S, walked up to the wagon and said, in an undertone, don't start anything, John. They are looking for any excuse to destroy us. Anyone who makes a false move to false move or refuses to take orders is missing the next morning. Such men are secretly taken out in the night and they are never seen again. Mr. Luz had climbed up on upon the wagon wheel. John motioned him aside so he could get down on the wagon himself. But Lou stayed where he was, still pleading with John. He heard about he heard about Brother Potter getting shot, didn't you? No, I did not know about that. Are you sure? John asked. Yes, I'm sure. They are. They they also stabbed Parrish and murdered his son. His friend said, "Oh my God, have they gone that far?" John said. Mister Parrish had been a good friend. That is a strong accusation to make against them, Brother Luz, unless they are, you are sure. I'm sure. We are all sure. Ask anyone in here. It happened right at the gate. Our only hope is with the United States Army. We hear it is outside of the city now and pray that it gets here in time to save us all. Good. So, any, so this is what was going on behind that walled city. So anyway, what happened was... And I read, I read other accounts of the parishes while I was doing my blood atonement work. So again, there is a lot of valid verification for these claims. Okay, keep going. Yeah. So anyway, so what happened was that he had to... John had to figure out a way to get his wife and family out of there. So he made friends with one of the guards. And he, he said he had tried... You know, he kind of feeled them all out. And he felt like this one was the most gullible. And so he, he ended up... Uh, telling this guard, if you'll get me a wagon and some oxen and get me get us out of here, I will deed you my land and all the other animals and everything I left there on my farm. I'll let you have it all, my house, everything. And he said, he, I forget how many acres of, uh, I think it was wheat that he had that was about ready to be cultivated. And so he told he told the guys like, yeah, because this guy was young. Yeah, heck yeah, I'll take it all, you know. And he said, okay, well, you get me this wagon and all this and that, and I will do it. And so 
sure enough, they got a, a few days later, they got a note and uh, was snuck to his wife and said, you need to, you know, give this to John. And so he told John, he says, I'm going to have the wagon and everything ready to go. And so on that one night, they got out and they got in the wagon. They were able to escape, get out. They got out in the wagon and they started heading down. At, uh, the, the guard actually told them, you need to go a, this other route. Don't go this route. Go this route because, you know, you might be followed. Well, John was kind of leery of that thinking, well, maybe it's a setup, but he went ahead and did it anyway. So he, they're on the trail and they're heading to, they're, you know, across, I guess it's Nevada or Cal, going to California. They were getting close to the desert. They've been gone out of Utah about two to three days. And uh, all of a sudden, um, they see all this dust in the, in, the, in the air coming in horses' hooves. And they're like, oh, no, you know, this has got to be the avenging angels coming after us. So he made Mary and the kids get off, and there were some big boulders, and go hide in the boulders. And he said, I'm going to go on down a little ways. You guys stay behind the rocks. And I'm going to go down and I'm going to wait at the wagon train. I've got my gun and all this, but you guys just keep quiet. So he goes on down a little ways. He can still see the, you know, the rocks. Mary can see the wagon train, the wagon. Anyway, so as they're approaching, uh, he was ready. He had his gun. He was waiting for him. He was going to start shooting him. And Mary couldn't, has, he, she just couldn't stand it no longer to see if it was. So she came out from behind the rock just to peek to see who it was. And it was the army from the United States. Oh, and, okay. and, and so Mary at that time comes all the way out from behind the rock. And she says, John, John, stop. Don't shoot. It's the United States army. Don't, don't shoot. So he put his gun down and, and her and the children came out from behind the rocks. And um, the army said, are, are you the Griffiths? And they said, yes, we are. They said, well, we've been looking for you. We got word that you had escaped several nights ago. And uh, we were told that by one of your friends inside the camp. And there, all the, uh, uh, the Utah, the Salt Lake has been saved by the U.S. Army. And all the people that were in there behind the walls now have been let out. And we've got a wagon train coming on this same road being let out by the Army and let's just wait here until they all get here. And then you can all follow us. We will protect you to get out of here. And they took wow. them all the way to California. And so for protection. And so um, anyway, John even said, I'm going to go back. I'm going to get my farm and I'm going to get my crops. And, and, the, and the guy, the army guy said, no, you're not going back. Because if you do, they said, polygamy has not been stopped yet. And Brigham is not going to give it up. You know, he was not going to give it up at all. Um, and so that's, uh, he even referred to Brigham Young in this diary that it was like a king being dethroned, that Brigham was not yeah. going to give it up early. But anyway, this book, I mean, seriously, it's it's worth the, the whole read. It's really good. But they did escape because of the army saving all those people in Utah, all, there was lots of people behind the wall that escaped with this wow. army. And do you know what's so fascinating? It is, so even talking to Barbara Jones Brown about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, the way that they explain it or talk about it is war strategy, because Brigham considered that he was at war with the, Ameri with the United States because they, he didn't want to be dethroned right? They wanted fair government. And Brigham said, absolutely not. I have to be here. So anyway, I can imagine that they were telling themselves, these people are traitors. Any apostate is a traitor and deserves uh, the, the, the war mentality combined with the blood atonement teaching, which was ubiquitous at this time period. You can see how this, this all would, of course, be what was happening. This conversation was so good that we didn't want to cut it down. So we've decided to break it into two parts. So I'm going to pause here for the first part. And you can look forward to part two being released either next week or sometime in the upcoming weeks. But I want to, again, 
give a huge thank you to Cheryl and Dan for all of their work, for sharing their thoughts, for engaging on these important topics, and just for the incredible people they are. So thank you again, Cheryl and Dan, for joining me. And thank you to all of you who are following us along with on this journey, who are open to truth, and who are willing to go into these difficult topics with me. I really appreciate it, and I will see you next time. <music>